Uh, thanks all for being here today. Um, I came to CMS in the fall of 2015 with the intention of making the presidential election the focus of my thesis. And in the most basic sense, that is what I did in the study and what I'll be presenting on today. But few could have predicted in advance just how tumultuous, transformative, and for many of us disheartening the election would end up being. Of course, you can only fit so much into 100 pages and, and uh, 20 minutes, and so there are huge and important aspects of the election that won't get much mentioned today, including the disturbing rise of fake news, the alleged involvement in the election by foreign actors, and the failure of pollsters to predict the outcome, any of which by themselves could certainly have constituted a thesis. But what I present today nonetheless has implications, I think, at least implicitly, for these other questions. In my thesis, I offer an overview of the flows of communication between candidates, voters, and the media over the course of the campaign. In particular, I explain how this new, new communication ecosystem was especially beneficial to Donald Trump, a charismatic candidate purporting to be an outsider who drew on populist and paranoid tropes in his campaign. At the center of his communication strategy, as I will show, is the social network Twitter. And as president, Donald Trump's use of Twitter continues to dominate the news agenda, providing a powerful personal outlet for the most powerful person in the world. Before I turn to the 2016 campaign, I'm going to introduce a concept, paranoid populism, and two figures from 20th century American history who embodied it in their media use. Paranoid populism is the shorthand I use for the combination of two related but distinct ideological constructs, populism and political paranoia. As we'll see, paranoid populism, as I render it, offers a useful lens through which to view the Trump candidacy, and as a way to understand and even start to explain his success. Although populism in American politics has eluded precise definition, scholars nonetheless agree on several, or several of its characteristics. As its name suggests, populism purports to advocate for the people, though in truth, populists specifically revere quote, ordinary people, or what Michael Hazen dubs a noble assemblage. In fact, it may be more appropriate to refer to, not to a group of people, but to a place, what Paul Taggart calls the heartland. Populism is defined, moreover, in its opposition to a selfish coastal elite, unconnected and unconcerned with the plight of the heartland. These appeals to the pure, ordinary heartland, in contrast to an elite as cosmopolitan as it is corrupt, it almost invariably stoke economic resentment as well as cultural antagonism. Given this objection to coastal elites, populist movements are typically spearheaded by a figure with outsider credentials, especially someone with charismatic communication abilities who tells it like it is. One final feature typically associated with populism is that it is manifested in the communication strategies of its leaders as a conscious rhetorical project. I thus argue that Donald Trump's use of Twitter as an unfiltered means of communication was the essence of his populist appeal. But populism alone does not fully encapsulate the candidacy of Donald Trump. We also need to consider what I call paranoia, a concept which here should be considered in a political rather than a clinical sense. Richard Hofstadter's influential essay of 1964, The Paranoid Style in American Politics, provides an insightful look at the appeal of this strain of thinking and its impact. Hofstadter's essay, written amidst the rise of far-right Republican candidate Barry Goldwater, pinpoints three characteristics, exaggeration, suspicion, and conspiratorial fantasy, which he says constitute paranoia. Like populism, paranoia is an ideological construct targeting certain sets of people, chief among them, according to Daniel Pipes, both the politically disaffected and the culturally suspicious. Paranoid thinking shares much with populist ideology, not least an um, us versus them mentality, distrustful of elites. Its appeal, like that of populism, can be accentuated by media technology. In 1964, Hofstadter noted that the quote, villains today are much more vivid than those of their paranoid predecessors. Yet the two terms are not entirely overlapping. Politicians famous for their anti-communist paranoia, including Goldwater and Joseph McCartney, were not known for populist politics. And McCartney, McCarthy was spelled by his own lack of charisma. When combined, however, populist ideology and paranoid thinking can prove powerful, especially when enabled by the media of the day. Two figures from 20th century American history, Charles Coughlin and Pat Robertson, both employed paranoid populist tropes and tactics in their quest to build dedicated audiences on emerging communications platforms, and their stories are therefore instructive. It's possible, Michelle Hines writes, that no single individual had more of an impact on thinking about the radio audience than Charles Coughlin. Ordained as a Catholic priest in 1916, Coughlin began a regular radio broadcast in 1926, a time when the medium was in its infancy. His sermons, initially focused on narrow religious matters, 
but became over time almost exclusively political in content. Cobb employed a wide variety of rhetorical techniques and a folksy mode of address to appeal to the man in the street. Coggin's audience was drawn to his coverage of America's deep financial depression and the blame that he ascribed for this uh, to the industrial elite as well as to the Roosevelt administration. In so doing, Coggin tapped into a then flexible communication platform around which few norms or laws have been established. He initially enjoyed easy access to his audience through an independent system of radio stations which broadcast his sermons, meaning, in essence, that if one station objected to his content, he could simply strike a deal with a rival. Coggin's audience peaked at a remarkable 16 million in 1938, giving rise to the possibly apocryphal notion that hearing his voice out of every window, you could walk for blocks and never miss a word. Yet Coglin's large audience would not prove eternal. A combination of religious, political, and media elites ultimately conspired to take him off the air. As more radio stations eventually turned against him, the outbreak of the Second World War, which Coglin had vehemently opposed joining, saw new limits placed on, quote, controversial public issues, one of the precedents for the Fairness Doctrine, which would be introduced in 1949. Before his fall from grace, Coggin had nonetheless demonstrated the appeal of paranoid populism and its ability to thrive on a new communications platform, at least while political and market conditions were favor favorable and before regulation had caught up. Coggin's experience brings to mind another paranoid populist firebrand, Pat Robertson, who also utilized an emerging medium to build a similarly loyal, if narrower, following. Robertson's Christian Broadcasting Network, launched in 1961, broadcast its programming via satellite, making his religious messaging seemingly descended from the heavens. Robertson's movement set itself against the perceived liberal excesses of the 1960s, appealing to the more traditional values of ordinary folk. In his broadcasts, Robertson seized the mantle of evangelical conspiracism and built on the tradition of prophecy theology, which predicted an imminent second coming, prefigured by apostasies including drugs and divorce. This unmediated Christian perspective was made possible through CBN's satellite transmission system, as well as by changes in regulation, which made religious broadcasting technically and economically feasible. CBN was eventually available on 3,000 cable systems, and the number of Americans viewing religious programming rose from around 5 million in the late 60s to around 25 million in the mid 80s. Robertson's media success bred political ambitions, but he would ultimately struggle to broaden his base, and he failed to win a single state when he ran in the Republican presidential primary in 1988. Indeed, his audience actually fell by 52% during his presidential run. Amongst other reasons, it seems that his attempts to go mainstream and secure the widest slice of the Republican electorate needed for the nomination forced him into more specific political pronouncements, many had altered the space. The experiences of Charles Coleman and Pat Robson differ, but share some characteristics. Both were paranoid populists who exploited emerging media technology before either rivals or regulation could catch up. Political factors for Coleman the Second World War and for Robertson the realities of majoritarian politics also eventually hampered their ambitions. But viewed in another way, each had what the other one lacked. Coggins' platform was broad but shaky, ripped from under his feet by regulations and nervous networks. Robertson's audience was deep but narrow, and he was unable to broaden it to encompass the widest swathe of voters when he ran for president. It seems then that any paranoid populist seeking prominence and public office needs a hybrid communication strategy with both a direct, unfiltered platform and the ability to get noticed by a much wider audience. Which brings us to Donald Trump. I won't spend much time here rehashing the story of the 2016 presidential election since it remains obviously fresh in everyone's minds. But it is worth remembering at the outset several of the perceived weaknesses of Trump's candidacy when he started. He was up against 16 other Republican presidential candidates, the largest field in history, which meant that before any votes were even cast, endorsements, fundraising, and media attention were in high demand. In terms of both endorsements and fundraising, Trump, with minimal support inside the GOP and little organization, was running well behind. Campaign filings in January 2016, on the eve of the first primaries, and after some candidates had already dropped out, um, show Trump running only fourth in the fundraising states. Uh, well, even by the time Trump clinched the nomination, uh, the, the nomination in May, he remained disliked in the party, sitting in fourth on rankings of elected uh, Republican officials' endorsements. As we'll see, the, Trump, the metric that Trump did dominate was media attention. In this respect, Trump had several inbuilt advantages, including decades of experience dealing with the media, primarily tabloid newspapers, and his years hosting NBC's Apprentice Show. Trump also had a Twitter account set up under, in 2009 under the handle at Real Donald Trump, which reached several million followers at the outset of his campaign. And for the past several years, Trump was the informal, speaks, informal chief spokesperson of the Bertha movement, 
a group which falsely alleged that President Barack Obama had been born outside the United States and was thus ineligible to serve. Trump, in other words, knew how to get attention, in large part by saying and doing outrageous things. And in its early stages, his campaign was treated as a joke, with prediction website 538 writing of his chances and the Huffington Post news website deciding to cover Trump's campaign in its entertainment section. Yet on the trail and on Twitter, Trump's campaign began to gather steam, and it appears that in both domains, Trump embraced the tropes of a paranoid populist in the manner of those who came before. I ran the text of all of Trump's tweets through corpus of linguistic software to determine his most common words and phrases. As you might expect, his slogan, Make America Great Again, was one of his favorite hashtags during the primary, as this chart shows, coming up 286 times overall, which accounts for one in every 200 words he tweeted. The phrase perfectly encapsulates the paranoid populism as defined earlier, and is evidence that Trump's campaign was deliberately targeting, targeting disaffected voters. Many people have responded to the slogan by asking, well, when exactly, in Trump's estimation, was America great? Trump managed to avoid being pinned down on this question directly during the campaign, but his staunch attacks on the legitimacy and record of Barack Obama, the country's first African-American president, are pertinent. By simultaneously alleging that America had seemingly lost its greatness, and by pinpointing the country's first black president as the chief agent in this process of perceived decline, Trump was making a very, very particular appeal to America's heartland. As noted earlier, by replacing the people per se with the heartland, populists can restrict the scope of their appeal to citizens deemed culturally and racially ordinary. Through his slogan and other campaign pronouncements, Trump tapped a vein of American normalcy which stretched back centuries, seeking to restrict its scope to the country's heartlands and implicitly then to a particular kind of cultural and racial, racial hegemony. Turning to the general election against Hillary Clinton, Trump on Twitter defied the traditional migration to the center ground to double down on his paranoid populist rhetoric. As this graph shows, Make America Great Again emerged as Trump's top hashtag during the general. His second and third most popular phrases were America First, a phrase of a long history in isolationism tinged with anti-Semitism, uh, and Drain the Swamp, another classically populist, anti-elitist sentiment referring to Washington bureaucrats. Yet in, in addition, to look at what Trump said, it's also instructive to look at how he used the platform. Trump began the campaign with almost 3 million followers and had earned 13 million by election day, showing quite linear growth in his follower count. This is an impressive number for any politician not named Barack Obama, and in, in itself partially explains Trump's prodigious tweeting throughout the campaign. Twitter, though, is a famously messy network, ridden with bots, trolls, and much else, so it is reasonable to assume that Trump was reaching far fewer than uh, the 3 or 13 million voters each time he tweeted. One of the strengths of Twitter, though, is that the potential for amplification is built uh, into its architecture through its retweet functionality. As such, it's actually possible to analyze the amount of wider reach that Trump's tweets received during the campaign. So for each month, I've, I calculated the, number of, the average number of retweets that each tweet received, as shown here. As you can see, the amount of amplification that Trump received for his tweets uh, rose considerably over the course of the campaign from an average of only 200 re retweets at the outset, so over 12,000 for tweets sent in October 2016, the last month of the campaign. This effect mostly holds even when we control for his rising number of followers across the period. Trump, of course, started the campaign with a base of followers far in excess of the average presidential candidate. This should disabuse any notion that Trump led a campaign from the virtual grassroots. He has, in fact, enjoyed high levels of name recognition for many years. But what he did do was utilize his existing following into a source of much wider exposure for, both, for the paranoid populist messaging he deployed, both on Twitter and beyond. And yet, as Trump appears to have intuited, reaching several million followers, or even several million more through retweets, wasn't enough. He also needed to establish as much exposure as possible in the mainstream media. Another part of Twitter's architecture is the app reply, which links your own tweet to the account of somebody else by using the app key. As this chart shows, in, his most, in the most common use of uh, ad replies, Trump sought attention from predominantly media sources, uh, with a couple of strange exceptions. Uh, in, in the primary, this mostly meant the at least somewhat sympathetic to his campaign, Fox News Channel. In the general election, however, Trump's media diet appears to have evolved to include centrist sources like CNN and the New York Times. Yet to a greater extent than in the primary, Trump's references to the media are about more than simply increasing his exposure. 
Of his 38 references to the Times, for example, fully 25 were to, quote, were to be, quote, failing in New York Times. This suggests an evolution in Trump's strategy. Trump's tweets during the general election seem to have had less to do with highlighting his media experiences and more to, media appearances and more to do with objecting to unfavorable coverage by seeking to delegitimize the organizations providing it. Thus, Trump used Twitter to both deploy paranoid uh, populist tropes and target media sources, seeking both attention and retribution for perceived criticism. It seems to, seems to evoke something of a hybrid uh, strategy, stoking the small but committed base of followers through a direct, unmediated slew of messages and reaching out, however angrily, to try to gain a foothold in the mainstream media. For those whom Trump was reaching directly through his Twitter account, media exposure presumably did not affect their support one way or the other. But for the larger bulk of prospective voters whose support he sought, Trump required if not a supportive, then, then at least an interested mainstream media. Of course, Trump was not the first candidate ever to seek media exposure. For decades, campaigns have tried to find cheap and efficient ways to get through the media's gatekeeping process, which restricts the flow of information to the public. In the past, everything from press releases to photo ops have been used by campaigns to try to seize the media spotlight. If it works, this can result in free media, as opposed to expensive TV ads. Another theoretical concept is useful here for thinking about how the media covers news. In a book about the Vietnam War, Daniel Hallam introduced the three spheres of political discourse in America. First, there is a sphere of consensus, apple pie issues about which most everyone agrees and for which an opposing viewpoint does not need to be presented. The second sphere is that of legitimate controversy. This contains issues about, uh, which are region, reasonably disagreed about, such as whether marijuana should be legal. The third sphere is a th sphere of deviance, issues so outside the mainstream that journalists condemn them, such as heinous crime. And points for anyone who gets the county reference here. Yet there are two counterintuitive things to consider about Hammond's spheres. First, they are permeable. Issues can move between them over time. Consider, for example, attitudes towards women's suffrage between the 19th century and today. And second, studies show that journalists disproportionately choose to cover the unions even as they condemn it. Over the course of the campaign, Donald Trump made myriad deviant statements. In many cases, there were no shortage of people decrying them as abnormal or wrong. But it is also true that the sheer interest in Trump's campaign often outweighed concerns about condemnation. In an interview at Harvard on the eve of the election, CNN President Jeff Zucker expressed regret for the hours upon hours of live, unfiltered footage of Trump's rallies that his network broadcast. Of course, this coverage was an enormous ratings hit, an economic consideration which undoubtedly contributed to the network's decisions. But without a filter of condemnation, this coverage served to normalize and even partly legitimize Trump's candidacy. My analysis suggests that Trump's deviance on Twitter meant his account was also overcovered with respect to other candidates. Following my research by Query Media Cloud, a database developed by MIT's Center for Civic Media, for the Twitter handles of each of the Republican candidates over the course of the primary. As this graph shows, even when, um, the uh, mainstream media references to real Donald Trump were far in excess to the Twitter handles of his rivals, who barely get looking. Of course, correlation between Trump's deviance and the disproportionate coverage his tweets got doesn't prove a causal relationship. And many of these references to Trump's Twitter were presumably condemning him. But it nevertheless says a lot that Trump's paranoid populist tweeting received so much mainstream coverage during the primary election, at a time when media attention contributed considerably to a candidate's viability. And so what have I shown today? First, that Trump's campaign contained many of the paranoid populist tropes of his ideological forebears, and that much of this ideology manifested itself in his communication strategy, which was abnormally focused on Twitter. Second, and related, that Twitter offered Trump a direct, unfiltered line to his base of committed supporters, sending messages which were amplified by them through the network. And finally, that Trump, who begged for media attention, even as he besmirched the outlets which provided it, succeeded in getting through the gatekeepers in large part because of the deviance of his paranoid populist stances. Thus, Trump needed the loyal following, melded the loyal following of Pat Robertson with a broad appeal of Father Coughlin to become America's first paranoid populist president. Every election is decided by a myriad of factors, but in the case of 2016, my research suggests that without at real Donald Trump, we wouldn't have President Donald Trump. Thanks for listening. I welcome your questions, and if you want to discuss this any further later, I'm on Twitter. <laughs>
you present a very like nice and tidy uh, line of the partner populist style and relationship to new media forms, and you're tracing from radio to satellite TV to Twitter. And I guess I'm just wondering, um, why should we be convinced of the importance of Twitter to just win the campaign? It's, it's, it's a nice, maybe I'm feeling like it's a little bit too neat. In other words, if we, if we could imagine the Donald Trump campaign without Twitter, we could say, you know, the primary amplifier of his paranoid populist rhetorical tropes was Fox News or even satellite radio still. Uh, or we might think about what he's doing as a, you know, an intentionally cross-media strategy where he's very aware of the way he's going to be covered by mainstream media first and Twitter is playing some type of role, but not necessarily. Yeah. So why why should we be convinced that it's a central element? Uh, and a part of part of the part of that question is about the very low uh, use of Twitter uh, among the broader population. And I don't know, but I'm curious if you looked at sort of Twitter use rates among the Trump supporters versus others. I think Twitter is something that's used by the younger, wealthier, and more coastal demographic. Although that may have shifted because of this. So talk about that a little. Sure, yeah, that's absolutely right. And, and I'm definitely um, uh, clear about the fact that Trump's strategy was cross media, right? So certainly uh, he was being boosted by uh, talk radio. The Fox News example is a little more uh, complicated because, of course, there was a flag around Kelly, and for a while it looked like they were going to not cover him as favorably as he or not give him at all as he'd like. So I think the emphasis on Twitter, while definitely a little too tidy, is just to emphasize the unmediated quality of that. I think that's something which both Colgan and Robertson, while they had their audiences in place, were able to exploit. Colgan could basically say whatever he wanted while he was giving a sentence. Eventually, he then got, got kind of tripped up by that. Um, and so I think Twitter is, if not unique, at least um, very interesting in, and instrumental insofar as it was a very unmediated line to his, um, to his following. And even if it wasn't always the sole focus of, of um, the, the voters themselves, they were being you know, quote unquote, fed a lot of this stuff by the media to vote. So a lot of it didn't emanate from Twitter, even though it wasn't, certainly wasn't the only uh, platform he was using. Yeah, I mean, I think an, another way to think about what Sasha's pointing to is that we assume that the value of Twitter is that Trump reached all his supporters directly every day, millions of them, right? But if the reality is that, well, actually, it reaches more educated, whatever class, people, whatever, it doesn't matter because those people run Fox News and and so on, and so that you could say that Twitter's value seems to be reaching a mass audience of directly, but its value really may be just mm -hmm. being able to shape the news events every day, because you know, and seizing the news cycle. Yeah, and that's one of the kind of main major implications of this. I think Trump as candidate was fascinating as a, as a subject of study. Now I think it's kind of imperative as Trump as president, particularly given that he can go online and tweet you know, and you say kind of set the news agenda today. Agenda setting is a phrase that I couldn't find room for in this presentation, but certainly appears in my thesis. And I think I tried to elucidate that, that as you say, the kind of two-step flow between uh, candidate to media to voters. Of course, there are several arrows missing from this, uh, this overview. There's an arrow from voters to Twitter, which is really important. There's an arrow from the media to Trump. And indeed, one of the really interesting things now is do we have an echo chamber between what Fox News wants to talk about and that what Trump tweets about and then what Fox News reports about, um, which is, if anything, scary and more worrying. But in terms of the campaign, the friction with Fox News was a reason to think about why Twitter, why Twitter was a really important tool. Yeah, Sorry. I mean, just briefly, just hypothesizing, elaborating on both what um, Sasha and Heather said, I mean, maybe Twitter was actually his unmediated line to the media mm -hmm. in the sense that, um, as you mentioned, like he was originally running a very lean campaign, right? Uh, he didn't have a lot of money, they weren't running a lot of ads. And, um, you know, this in conjunction with his calls and, you know, CNN coverage and all that might have been like a very smart, like business decision to reach directly to influencers and media outlets um, mm -hmm. who he knew would reliably amplify the message to his base. Yeah, absolutely right. It was a, it was a full <coughs> At times when Fox News wasn't letting on the air or CNN said something particularly nasty, that seemed to be the place where he went and it seemed to do a useful job in allowing him to really set the terms of the agenda. Katie, okay, you had to Yeah, so I was wondering kind of in this conversation if Twitter has this kind of potential and just because of the beginning of the interview about uh, the kind of other two populists and then you said more regulation. So I wonder how we would maybe do we need to regulate spaces like Twitter and how would we do that? Could you repeat 
the question for the live stream? Yeah, what sure. The question is basically, do we need to think about, and if so, how should we think about using Twitter as a uh, regulating Twitter to try and sort of um, prevent some of this, this stuff? You know, I think really the responsibility probably falls on the journalists because the instrumental kind of role they play that we talked about. Um, I, I think taking, you know, I think if, if I think Trump now, and possibly Trump in 2015, but certainly Trump now, is powerful enough that if Jack Dorsey decided to ban him, then there would be, um, you know, he would simply set up his own sort of platform. He would find them now, he would find, be able to find an unmediated way to talk to the public. So I think kind of kicking off Twitter as satisfying as that would be, probably wouldn't achieve too much. But I think certainly um, journalists and others can, including all of us who kind of banally retweet something we find maybe interesting, but not anything we remotely agree with, you know, everyone kind of needs to think about the tiny effect which adds up to a, a big effect of amplification that we all kind of do, and journalists in the tip of that iceberg, but a lot of people participate in that process. setting up. Josh, can you say something about yeah. Breitbart, Breitbart News and Bannon and so like, you know, uh, the Media Cloud team recently did an analysis of the Trump media sphere 